Hello, hello, Doofan911 back with another FSX video. Today we're going to look at a way of navigating called Dead Reckoning. So Dead Reckoning is also known as Deduced Reckoning. What does this mean? Well, it's a way of calculating our current position using a previously known position and working out where we're going to fly based on our direction, speed and amount of time that we travel. So why would we need to use Dead Reckoning as a pilot? Sometimes, when flying VFR, we won't be able to clearly see a landmark out of the cockpit. This would occur if you were to fly into clouds, fly over a large stretch of water, or a desert, for example. By using Dead Reckoning, we can work out how to reach the next landmark along our journey. First, there's a couple of new words we'll be using now that we're looking at more complex methods of navigating. The first word is FIX. Remember, when using pilotage, we were looking out for landmarks, things on the ground that we recognise and use to navigate. Well, these landmarks are more commonly known as a fix, a fixed point on the ground. Next up is leg. A leg is simply the route between two fixes. So, a quick example of these. Here we have two points, A and B. These are our fixes, and this line here is the leg between them. Here's another quick example. Let me ask you, how many fixes are there and how many legs are in this example? So the answers are 5 fixes and 4 legs. I hope that's clear. The next two words relate to the same thing. These are course and track. This is the imaginary line drawn over the ground, representing where we want our plane to travel and is measured in degrees from north. For example, if we wanted to fly directly east, we would need to fly a course or fly a track of 090 degrees. The course slash track tells us the direction of a leg. Next up we have three different types of speed. The first one is the one you're already familiar with and it's called indicated airspeed. This is what you see on the airspeed instrument in the cockpit. This is calculated by the pitot static system in the plane which uses the difference in air pressure of air passing over the plane to calculate the speed you're travelling through the air. The next speed we'll need to know is called true airspeed. This speed has been corrected to take into account the altitude and the temperature of the air. So why might this be different from the indicated airspeed? When flying at a higher altitude, the air is thinner, which means the plane can push through it easier, which generally means you'll fly through the air faster. Lastly, we have ground speed. This is the speed that we're travelling relative to the ground. The previous two speeds are how fast we're travelling relative to the air. Again, this can be different due to wind. For example, if you're flying into the wind, the plane will still pass through the air at a normal speed. However, it's going to slow your progress over the ground. If you have the wind behind you, you'll travel faster over the ground. Still with me? Take a moment to pause the video if you'd like. It does, get a while, it does take a while to get the hang of new jargon. So, let's put these things together and see how we would use them to plan a flight. So here we have two fixes, A and B, and let's pretend, for example, that they are airports. We want to fly from one airport to another. The first thing we need to do is draw the leg between the two fixes. Now, this leg will tell us two things. It will give us the course slash track, and it will give us the dif distance between the two fixes. To make it simple, Let's say that the course here is 120 degrees and the distance is 50 nautical miles. We want to make a note of these because we'll need them later. Next, we need to decide what speed and altitude we want to fly at. So let's say that we want to fly at 100 knots indicated airspeed. That's the speed that we see on the dial in the cockpit. And let's also say that we want to fly at 3000 feet. We need to make a note of these two numbers as well. The next step is to work out what our true airspeed will be, and we can do that by using something called an E6B computer, which looks something like this. Yes, be afraid. <laughs> yes, this is a real device used by pilots to calculate many things, with lots of slidey and twisty bits, but I prefer doing things in a, a more simple way. So I found an online version of this calculator at csgnetwork.com. You can click the link on the screen or in the description below to access it. On the website, we can find a true airspeed calculator right at the bottom. So here you see, it asks us for our indicated airspeed and our altitude. 
So type them in, 100 knots and 3000 feet, and it will give us our true airspeed. So you can see we'll have 100 knots showing in the cockpit, but at this altitude we'll actually be passing through the air at 106 knots. So we need to make a note of the true airspeed here. The last thing we need to do now is calculate how long it will take to fly this leg. Fortunately, it's a simple calculation. We take the distance, divide it by the speed, which will give us the time. So we have 50 nautical miles divided by 106 knots, which equals 0 0.47 hours. Multiply 0 0.47 by 60, because there's 60 minutes in an hour, and that gives us 28.3 which is how many minutes the flight will take. Make a note of this time as well. So now we have everything we need to fly this journey. Even in poor visibility, if we start at point A and fly a heading of 120 degrees, fly an indicated airspeed of 100 knots, and fly at 3000 feet, after 28.3 minutes, 28 minutes and 18 seconds, we will be directly over our next fix at point B there. Pretty cool, huh? However, there is one vital thing that I've missed, and that is wind. I've missed it on purpose because I wanted to try and simplify dead reckoning first for people who have never even heard of it. It can take a while to get your head around, so if you're struggling, feel free to pause the video or rewind to uh, go over it again. Um, I just hope that the way I'm explaining it makes sense. Um, but if you feel like you're understanding and I've got the hang of it, let's see how wind can affect our flight and how we can adjust for it. So let's use the same example, point A to point B, 50 nautical miles, a course of 120 degrees. This time though, let's add in some wind. Let's say that we're going to put in some wind at 090 at 15 knots. This means that the wind is coming from a direction of 090, it's coming from the east and it is blowing directly west at a speed of 15 knots. How would this affect our flight? Well, if we fly exactly the way we planned before, our plane would actually be blown sideways, of course, and we would end up over here somewhere. Not only that, but the wind is blowing against the front of the plane, which would slow us down over the ground as well. So what we need to do is aim the plane somewhere over here, so that the wind blows us sideways, but blows us along our planned course right onto our target. Fortunately for us, that E6B calculator is the perfect tool to work this out. So we plan out everything the exact same way as before. We want to fly a course of 120 degrees. It's 50 nautical miles. We're going to fly at an indicated airspeed of 100 knots and we want to fly at 3000 feet. The airspeed and the altitude gives us our true airspeed of 106 knots. Now it's at this point, once we've found our true airspeed, that we need to add in an extra step. If we go back to the E6B calculator, there's a section which says heading, ground speed and wind correction angle. This is the calculator that we want. So again, we simply enter the numbers that we now know. The wind speed will be 15 knots and the wind direction is 090. The true airspeed will be 106 knots and the course will be 120 degrees. When we hit calculate, we get a couple of new numbers that we need to make a note of. The first is heading. You'll notice that this is different to the course. The heading is the direction that the plane's nose is pointing. And remember, the course is the direction that the plane is travelling over the ground. Remember I said that we need to aim away from our target to adjust for the wind? The heading gives us that aiming direction. We need to make a note of that. Also, because the wind will be blowing on the front of the plane, that will slow us down over the ground. So you'll notice that our ground speed is down at 93 knots. Make a note of this as well. The wind's correction angle simply indicates the number of degrees difference between the course and the heading. Now, just as before, we need to calculate how long this journey will take, this time using the ground speed. So again, it's distance divided by speed equals time. So 50 nautical miles divided by 93 knots equals 0 0.54 hours. Multiply that by 60 which gives us 32.3 minutes. And as before we now know everything we need to complete this flight successfully. If we start at point A 
and fly a heading of 116 degrees to account for that sideways drift, fly at an indicated airspeed of 100 knots and fly at 3000 feet, we know that after 32.3 minutes, 32 minutes and 18 seconds, that we will be directly over our target at point B. And that's how you can use dead reckoning to assist with VFR flying. If you'd like to see an example of this in action, I've made a separate video here where I actually calculate a leg of a journey mid-flight. You can click on it on the screen here or click on the link in the description below. Before I recap, there's one other website that I like to use for dead reckoning. That is skyvector.com, which is like a cross between Google Maps and real life aviation charts. I use Skyvector to discover the course and distance between fixes, and you can use it to create a little flight plan. There's even a box where you can enter the ground speeds once you've calculated it, so you can use that to calculate how long your journeys will be. I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail in my example flight video there. Anyway, let's condense everything down into a simple 5 step guide now that we know a bit more about dead reckoning. Step 1. Plan the leg of your journey. Note down the course and the distance of the leg. Step 2. Decide on your indicated airspeed and altitude, and then calculate the true sp airspeed using the E6B calculator. Step 3. Find out the wind direction and speed. In FSX, you can find this out by using either of the real world weather options or by defining the weather yourself. Unfortunately, the pre-made weather themes don't offer um, the details of wind direction and speed. Step 4. Calculate the heading and the ground speed you'll need using the E6B calculator. And then step 5. Calculate the time of the leg, how long it will take to complete the journey. So, there you go. On a closing note, Dead reckoning is sadly becoming a lost skill due to more advanced forms of navigation and GPS technology. However, it is still t taught as part of real-world piloting. It is worth reminding you that you should be predominantly using pilotage when flying VFR. Dead reckoning is only used as a last resort if you get into a spot of bother or have to navigate a barren stretch of land or water. But I guess it's fun to learn new things, right? Once you're feeling confident with dead reckoning, you can even attempt to fly multiple legs. All you need to do is simply work out each leg individually. Of course, as always, if you have any questions, and I'm sure you probably do, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm no expert, but I'll do my absolute best to help you out. Anyway, looking forward to my next video, I'm going to step back from flying and talk about modding FSX to really get the most out of your flight simulator experience. We'll be looking at things which make the world look better, cool new planes and other fun stuff. So I hope to see you there and uh, if you've made it this far thanks for sticking with me I really do appreciate it. Thanks for watching I'll catch you later.